All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Zach Hubeck with Wave LLC, uh, VP of Sales and Marketing for Wave. I want to welcome everyone to our next edition of Airwaves Podcast. Today, we've got uh, a couple of guests, um, some some great figureheads in the wireless industry. I've got uh, Jamie Fink from Mimosa Airspan, and I also have uh, Blair Clements from ICT. Gentlemen, welcome. How are you both today? Great. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Doing well. Thank you very much, Zach. Awesome, guys. So today, gentlemen, our podcast is all about what you can expect in 2021 for wireless tech as it relates to RDOF, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. So it is uh, November 20th, 2020. Uh, the RDOF auction just started. So October 29th was when uh, the auction first started with the FCC. Uh, and really, if we talk through what we want to accomplish on the call today, I want to talk in a couple of ways. Um, where are we at in the RDOF process? Uh, we want to talk about technology trends and where technology is today versus four, five, six, ten years from now when RDOF funding is flowing and people are expected to deploy these networks. Um, how does technology fit into that equation? And then also, how does um, Mimosa, Airspan, and ICT help these RDOF awardees uh, in accomplishing what they need to accomplish upon uh, receiving an, uh, a, uh, an awarded uh, auction or they, award, they are awarded these funds? So we're getting way, way out in front with that first uh, little synopsis. But why don't we start with... Um, who are uh, the both of you? Who do you work for? And then what's your role? And I'm going to start with Blair on that one. Blair, tell us who you are. All right. Uh, my name is Blair Clements, obviously. I'm um, Director of Sales and Marketing with ICT, or uh, Innovative Circuit Technology. Um, and um, we're, we're a manufacturer of power conversion equipment, which is used in the, the fixed wireless broadband space to support uh, power requirements at tower sites, for example. So, Very cool. Great, glad glad you can make it, Jamie. How about yourself? Great, thanks. Uh, so, Jamie Fink, I was the uh, co-founder and CTO of Mimosa, uh, now part of the Airspan Group, uh, and important on both sides, especially with Ardoff, because obviously we we are a supplier of fixed wireless technology, um, both in the unlicensed bands and some of the licensed bands for backhaul, but also Airspan has a critical component of working on the CBRS. Uh, and also 5G technologies as well, which I think both of those technologies are going to come to bear as we talk more about RDOF and how to achieve different speed tiers and things like that. So uh, be able to represent on both fronts. Awesome. Beautiful. So Blair, over to you. Um, you touched pretty briefly on what you guys do, but how does, uh, how does ICT fit into the equation at a tower site or a location for a lot of these uh, operators? Uh, where does ICT fit into the equation? Yeah, um, we manufacture power conversion equipment, which is going to take your standard sort of utility power, which would be available at the site, so the AC power coming from the standard utility, and we convert that into the, the power requirements needed by a lot of these device, devices, including airspan devices, for example. So, you know, minus 48 volts DC or plus 24 volts DC that a lot of these devices need to operate. Um, and we kind of come in to provide a more comprehensive DC power plant solution. So rather than utilizing maybe the existing, uh, you know, the power that's provided by a particular OEM, for example, we actually provide a dedicated DC power plant, uh, which enables our, you know, network operators to uh, monitor power conditions at the site, check on the battery backup systems, how much power they've got left if they've lost AC power, and just have full comprehensive monitoring of their power conditions at the site, which, you know, enables them to, you know, resolve issues um, and and have a better quality of service overall for their customers in terms of keeping the power uh, operating at those sites. Cool. And Blair, is it a uh, total remedial question, but is it, uh, are your products, is it a requirement that they have to go physically on site to be able to monitor this? Or do you have a uh, element of your products where people can do this at their knocks? Yeah, actually, one of the, the advantages we do offer and a big part of why we've been so well received in the fixed wireless broadband space is, you know, the nature of a lot of these uh, installations being rural broadband, quite often they are in remote locations or they could be uh, fair distances from the operators themselves. So any issue that may occur at a site, which does happen on occasion, obviously, um, 
in the past, you know, uh, quite often they'd have to send a technician or an engineer, a network engineer out to the site to sort of resolve the issue. And, and a lot of times it's a fairly simple issue uh, that could be resolved by simply potentially just cycling power to a troublesome device, for example. So, you know, being able to remotely log in, which you can with the ICT equipment, and you can do it from your home or your office or wherever you need to be and monitor uh, all, the, all different parameters of the DC power at the site and remotely turn devices on and off if you're having an issue uh, can really help in terms of reducing an operator's uh, operating expenses uh, and not having to send someone out to the site, but also increasing their quality of service of being able to resolve an issue more quickly than actually physically having to, to travel to the site to, to troubleshoot. Very cool. Power management from your couch. That's what I heard. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Very cool. Well, good. So, guys, uh, we're talking RDOF. Okay, so 386 approved bidders were allowed to bid in the auction on October 29th. Guys, we're, the, the amount of federal funding here is just uh, amazing. $20.4 billion over 10 years. Um, so, really, um, Jamie, why don't you take this question? Where are we at in the process? The auction has started and yep. just really for the folks at home, where are we at, at in the process and how's it going? Yeah, so this first tranche of the auction process is a $16 billion portion of the fund, I believe. <clears throat> so it is the big piece of the remaining $4 million will be pending um, a redo of the broadband mapping exercise to, to put a finer point as we they get through the first phases of deployment to figure out where people still don't have broadband. So it's a little bit of an iterative uh, pencil sharpening process as they go through the pro to go through to do the final ad of the last four billion. So where are we now? We are three weeks uh, roughly into the auctioning process and by all accounts uh, it is slowing down um, so to, so to speak, which actually means that the windows for the auctions are now becoming very short by they used to be like four four six hour long windows they're now down to one or two which means very few bids are coming in um the pencils have been sharpened so i'd expect that the auctions are going to close sometime in the next week um and we will it'll take some time for them to get all that published and for all of us to see who's on that list um i'm expecting a lot of the same guys that we saw in the CAF 2 auctions of course, um, and uh, a, a number of new entrants. Uh, obviously, you've got new satellite entrants like Starlink out there uh, uh, bidding on this stuff. Uh, but uh, we're we're so we're getting to the end of the cycle here, so I think we're primed to have some news fairly soon on the process. All right, very cool. And and just to uh, expound on your point, the you know the sixteen billion is is reserved for the unserved. So the FCC has identified, we know these areas are unserved. I think that $4 billion is for after the, the $16 billion. You said there's going to be a, some due diligence and some pencil sharpening there, but that, that $4 billion is going to be for the underserved. And kind of that, that um, so it's kind of two rounds, if you will. But yeah. um, uh, you know the net net of it is twenty point four billion dollars is is quite a bit, and it, it's good to see that our government is uh, absolutely investing in connecting areas of the country that just are not connected today. Um, so let let's talk the technology aspect of this, guys. So um, this is kind of like a uh, a VHS to. Uh, a a beta to a VHS to a DVD player to a blue a Blu-ray kind of um, dialogue and conversation. It's 2020, and eight years from now, there's going to be a lot. Uh, you know, technology is going to look much much different. How does uh, technology innovation play into RDOF bidding today, and what does that look like from a speeds, a throughput, a latency perspective? Uh, many years down the road. And Jamie, why don't you take that first and then Blair, if you wanted sure. to follow up, that would be great. Yeah, so let me, I'll get some context because I think we we need to, to to go back to where this began, which was CAF2. And the because the, that indicates to us how the process worked from an auction perspective. And the Connect America Fund, we learned rapidly that fixed wireless became the predominant way that was going to be used other than some satellite on lower speeds. And the baseline speeds, which are the 25 megabit tier, um, really was only a very small portion of the money. Most all the money went towards 100 megabit uh, down and 25 megabit up, which is called above baseline. Um, now that everybody's gone through this process, 
and figured out also what kinds of requirements the FCC is going to have for measuring and ensuring that you're meeting the speed goals uh, that, that are necessary to be a, 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 a provide these offerings. Um, we definitely saw some drop off of some people that said this is pretty hard to do. It's hard to hit the speeds and it's hard to keep the speeds up. And this is an end to end thing. It's not just the speed to the customer, but is there enough backhaul at a site? Um, and, you know, are there enough base stations to handle the capacity, you know, based on their initial plans? So I think everybody's learned. But what we one thing we did learn was you win these things by committing to higher speeds than other guys because you get better bidding credits in the in the process. And since the, the auction's already going on, it's not worth touching really on the depth of that. But the important factor here is more people are going to bid gigabit than ever because that's the only way you can get your leg up in your bid to win. So the big thing I heard in all of the preparatory architectural discussions for RDOF with ourselves as a supplier was, what do you have that can get me a gigabit? And how am I gonna make this work? I, I, what, is, what kind of oversubscriptions do I need to be able to prove speed tests but versus how many people are on a base station and what kind of capacities at peak? There was a lot more work this time around that that was not in play in my opinion in CAF2. So I think we're, we're at that generational point where what kinds of technology are there that can do gigabit? And actually the answer to that right now is actually nothing. Um, today, as we speak, there's almost nothing that can really get the job done. But looking to a bright future, 2021 already was on track for the gigabit tiers technologically. And it's no coincidence that people are, as a result of that, building it another roadmap. You look at the timeline, you say, okay, probably second half of 2021 is the earliest point at which you start to see funds get put to use. Um, and that's in line now with going into that in, in, into early 2022, that all of this technology should, should be available to hit those speeds. Getting 100 megabit to these places is no longer an issue. That's easy. Getting to a gigabit is a real challenge here. Got it. And Jamie, for, for those, um, you know, we're talking about 386 bidders, um, you know, for those that didn't touch Jamie Fink or Mimosa or Airspan uh, and ask, hey, what do you have? What can be accomplished? Uh, I know you shared feedback with those those folks. Are there any specific platforms or solutions or radios that sure. you kind of coach those folks that those other three, you know, the th of the 386, maybe you touched 80% of those. The other 20%, yeah. what would you say to them from a coaching perspective? So I, I think what we're seeing now is uh, not only new technology coming out. So we have this uh, Wi-Fi 6E technology that's been coming out, but we also have new spectrum to go with it. So we finally have channel sizes and a quiet portion of spectrum to use that'll easily achieve those kinds of speeds. We're, we're already seeing easily 1.75 gigabits to clients. Um, and if you really needed it up to 3.5 uh, and higher of, of actual aggregate capacity, um, and that's going to be using the six gigahertz spectrum, which is you know relatively shorter range um, in context to the old school wisp ten mile long uh, in the middle of nowhere kind of stuff. This is you're going into these areas, you're going to put more towers in, more sites. You know what ICT is doing, they're going to have to put power up a ton more sites to be able to get close enough to the subscriber to make it through the, to be able to power through the trees and the foliage. And that's what we're that's what we've been seeing. You've got to be able to have a capacity band that can really handle a large portion of customers, mostly in line of sight. And then you've got to be able to bring to bear other spectrum and other tools when you have customers' houses that are behind the trees that don't get can't see the tower. And that's where things like CBRS, also new spectrum, uh, I think are going to be make a big difference. And uh, there's less of that spectrum, and it's going to be quite contended for. Uh, so, and, and most of most of those are uh, 4G and soon to be 5G technologies. There's some proprietary ones as well, but generally speaking, that 3.5 gigahertz band and especially the LTE 5G technologies are much better at making it through trees in particular. So, we believe that it's going to be this mix of get as many customers covered as possible with the. The, the high capacity six gigahertz and five gigahertz technology and use that that cellular spectrum 3.5 band uh, for knocking off the customers that really need the most help 
uh, from a signal level perspective because of trees and, and other occlusions that might happen. Um, so the, that's the broad guidance we have to give people. Uh, you know, we can't cure cancer with one answer here, unfortunately, but um, we do have the technologies that can solve most of the problems. Very cool. So Blair, similar similar question for you. As we as these devices and as the speeds um, uh, as sp speeds increase, the latency drops. Jamie talked quite a bit about uh, power draw and additional considerations there. As you look out in the crystal ball several years from now, what is ICT doing from a planning perspective to address all of these devices uh, and the additional power consumption that's um, going to take place? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, being a power provider, that's, that's um, our main focus. Um, independent of the technologies that we're talking about when it comes to deployment uh, on the radios, et cetera, um, we're focused on what the power requirements may start to look like for some of these sites as uh, different technologies are deployed. So we have, uh, the way we sort of design sort of our, our, our flagship product, if you will, is it's very scalable. Um, so customers that may have existing sites that are maybe adding additional equipment and require additional power at those sites, um, rather than having to go in there and, and remove the existing you know, power conversion infrastructure, ICT equipment or whatever equipment may be installed, we're able to scale up uh, by adding additional power modules and it's a very quick process for customers to be able to add uh, scalable power as needed as those you know, power requirements for those sites uh, grow. So. From our perspective, we're looking at it from a very modular way um, where it's just simply uh, plug and play, if you will, by adding uh, additional power modules, which would scale up the power for those types of sites that need it. So uh, um, pretty quick to implement is sort of the philosophy we're, we're going with in that, in that, in that sense. Very cool. Zach, I, I, I might add that, uh, you know, yeah. What we're seeing is all of these new devices, and especially mobile mobile base stations and things, they're much higher power than WISPs are used mm -hmm. to dealing with. Uh, so I think generationally we're moving from a, hey, it's pretty easy to put out a, a PoE plus uh, you know, kind of output to, oh, geez, I, I'm putting a serious amount of gear with some serious power at the top of a tower. And that's going to be DC fed, not not just PoE anymore. It, you just can't get the job done on copper alone as well as uh, PoE. I mean, it, it really is a re-engineering for the WISPs to be looking a lot more like big boy carriers from a powering perspective. Nice, that's a, that's a really good point. And, and you've got great perspective into that, Jamie, because of your Mimosa affiliation, because of your Airspan affiliation, you're seeing that today. And uh, Blair, uh, in, a, in a WISP network where you may have uh, if someone wants to add a manufacturer's radio to their network, or maybe they have a, a mixed network where they're acquiring uh, somebody who might be a, a ubiquity shop and they are a, a mimosa shop, we're not talking about management systems of RF and how do we manage all of these radios together. We're talking about power and to hear from you that this is very scalable and modular. Yeah, it is an add-on. That's one uh, checkbox for some of these guys that that is going to remove uh, kind of the the headaches of a new merger and acquisition, which a lot of people that have participated in an art off may find themselves doing. Uh, it's cool to hear that um, you guys make it very very seamless and modular. Modular there. Yeah, I mean we've gone through that process. I mean, as you know, in the last decade, the, the landscape when it comes to, to WISPs has changed dramatically in terms of acquisitions of smaller players into sort of these large organizations, which are almost approaching sort of like carrier type grade in terms of installation. So in the past, maybe 10 years ago, uh, there wasn't a lot of emphasis or, uh, you know, I guess a perception that, you know, power was as important at these types of sites. Um, as these sites are, are growing and, and becoming more power intensive, and as the expectations, I think, from the customer base are growing too, like the, the expectations for quality of service, I think are a lot higher today than they would have been maybe 10 years ago where people were kind of used to getting patchy internet service potentially, whereas now the expectation is, you know, I need internet. It's, a, it's an essential service and there's, uh, there's very little, uh, you know, appetite for having spotty service or and that in that sense. So having reliable power to back up a lot of these sites is becoming more critical. Yep, absolutely. Crucial element there. All right, Jamie. So you talked a little bit about the ratio of, um, you know, the the higher speeds here. So you're anticipating a lot more people 
bidding gigabit. Um, I think one thing that's that's cool about the Ardoff auction is more visibility to people that uh, maybe we're in that 25 meg or 100 meg category with Ardoff versus CAF. You could actually see if someone is bidding gigabit and people um, you know, would not pursue that. So there's better visibility, better tools um, available for folks that are in, in the middle of the auction right now. Um, Talk to me, Jamie, a little bit about uh, fixed wireless success you anticipate seeing in light of the fact that a lot of people are going to be trying to go for this gigabit. Uh, are you concerned at all about fiber uh, versus uh, fixed wireless? If you could talk about that, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Uh, so taking away the the actual wireless piece of it, you know, the capacities that we're dealing with are just, uh, you know, as a great example, you know, we're moving from a, a 700 megabit uh, aggregate capacity access point to seven gigabits, right? So the the reality of that is that how the heck do I get the backhaul there, and how am I going to wire this all of this up? Um, it used to be, you know, we we know how difficult it is to maintain good quality interference free uh, Ethernet up a tower, um, and you know our reality with that was well, you still got to have that. People need that for smaller sites, but as you get to this level of capacity, if, if you're serving gigabit. Um, or if you're even either serving a ton of 100 meg customers, uh, fiber is a necessity. So, um, I mean, I, we're, while we're not announcing fully our products here yet, I can really tease out that obviously you can expect a lot of SFP+. Plus. Um, you can expect a lot of 10 gigabit connections. Um, we're very cautious about um, supporting like middle speeds, uh, like 2.5 gigs. A lot, of a lot of fiber switches don't support that. Um, and most of them are five and 10 gigabit kinds of things. So I think what you're going to see is a big shift towards that. Um, for smaller sites, especially, we're, we're kind of expecting um, guys like ICT to deliver, deliver DC that we can hub up at the top of, of these sites, but maybe daisy chain fiber between base stations, um, as opposed to going all the way down the tower with a bunch of fiber and, and doing switches and things like that. So I think there's going to be a lot of creative things that have to be done, um, but that's only just wiring. That's that's really almost nothing to do with feeding these sites. Now I now I got to figure out a way to get three, four, five, ten gigabits to sites that are miles away from fiber connections, and that that's where things are gonna are really gonna generationally change. It's gonna be a lot of dependence on E band. Um, and obviously, those distances need to be kept pretty short for that. You know, you're not talking ten miles. There's no products out there that do ten gigabits at ten miles today. Uh, you know, things like that. So we're we're gonna be Basically, having to go from tower to tower, keeping it shorter, relying on these higher frequency bands um, and new products that'll be coming out that'll support you know middle distances uh, with closer to three, four, five gigabits, which has never been done before either. So all of this is is kind of all we're all building towards these gaps that we know it's not just the the end piece to the subscriber; it's the wiring, the capacity, the backhaul, every step of the way. And I'll tell you, it's a, it's a ground up exercise. Every one of these products, solutions I'm talking about are brand new and all focused on being delivered really for the purpose and demand of Ardoff. Yeah, let me let me ask this kind of macro question, backing it way, way out, you know, so now the FCC is awarding people that can deliver gigabit speeds. I, I think the question begs to be asked and the, the dollars are there. We're, you know, we're talking bees in the billions here. But do you think um, that uh, taking this approach of awarding gigabit, uh, do you think that's going to do anything detrimentally to, as far as signing up more and more subscribers to connect more and more people? So, yes, the dollars are there, but it's going to take a lot of dollars to actually trench out and yeah. and deliver these gigabit speeds. Do you think there was a misstep there, or do you think the proportion yeah. of dollars to subscribers is justified? Right. Great question. I mean, the one thing I would say is that there was, uh, in my opinion, and, and the CAF guys, will, the CAF two guys will scream at me. I think there was too much money awarded per subscriber in a lot of areas um, that are very remote for 100 meg speeds, and I think that that's going to get right sized. So I think what you'll find is a lot of people will be, may, they may say, I'm, I'm, "I'll go for the gigabit," but I think the amount that you can get that you're going to have to bid to win 100 megabit is going to be more commensurate. Uh, to really what's needed to deliver 100 meg in those areas. So I think you'll see a balance. I mean, to your point, I mean, trenching, doing it on fiber, you're going to need, you know, near nearly, you know, five to 10,000 minimum 
you know, in a lot of cases, people in rural areas, I mean, I've seen out to fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars per home needed, not not awarded. But that's what some of these, um, you know, public utility commissions have had to do to connect up fiber and very remote special project areas. So sure. um, I believe that there will be some backing off and right sizing to 100 meg, and we'll just have to let the market decide. Personally, knowing consumer behavior, consumers don't pay for speed. They pay the lowest price that they can get. Most of them want uncapped bandwidth. Um, yep. If you're not buying your bandwidth from a cable provider, the trend is that you're, there's double to triple the amount of, of usage than you see on an AT&T or a Comcast customer, uh, because TV is not usually going through those services. Now they are going through those services. There'll be more people doing YouTube TV and things like that. So you'll find that they need to eliminate the terabyte caps and things like that. That's what customers are going to want, not necessarily gigabit speeds for more money. Yep. So, you know, where where I live, it's a very suburban area, part of Chicago. And, uh, you know, I now have gigabit um, to my home. And by God, I hope my children don't have enough devices in a couple of years to even <laughs> to even utilize all of that bandwidth. <laughs> um, my Black Friday may be um, very intense coming up here. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so Blair, Blair, over to you. Jamie talked about you know this process of it is very much about wiring and you know building things from the ground up. Can you talk to the audience at home about how ICT helps in this process of um, any configurators you might have or cool tools that ICT has when people engage with you and say, "All right, we want to go with ICT power solutions." How do you help them? Yeah, um, you know. Traditionally, you know, some of these WIFs are, are very obviously experienced in the, on the networking side and the RF portion of it, but the, the whole DC infrastructure in some cases is new to some of these folks. And so being able to support them in terms of installing uh, DC power plants at their networks is, is critical. So, you know, we, we obviously have a team here of application engineers. We work directly with a lot of these folks as they're going through the install process. Uh, and then, obviously, there's a lot of configuration guides that we're able to provide to these folks. Um, we we try to, you know, work with them to understand what their sort of tower architecture would look like in terms of the devices that they have um, and, you know, how many devices need support in terms of distributing DC power to those. And then we're able to come up with sort of configuration guides and, and um, basically sort of installation advice in terms of their installers so they can actually deploy this uh, this equipment in, in you know, fairly uh, simple matter. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's a new area for a lot of these folks, so we try to best support them with, uh, you know, wiring diagrams outside of the general operator's manuals, but sort of specific to their actual architecture. Um, this is how you need to connect all these devices. This is where it all gets connected. So we're able to provide that kind of level of support. And then the idea is, you know, Typically, they may have a small site or a medium site or larger sites, and they would just sort of, it would be a cookie cutter sort of scenario in terms of the deploying uh, the, the DC infrastructure for those types of sites. So we'll come up with configuration diagrams depending on the size of the site and the devices that are being uh, connected. Uh, in addition to that, obviously, you know, as these, you know, DC gets installed at m multiple sites as these networks grow in size, uh, you know, being able to deploy this quickly in terms of setting up the software and firmware within the ICT equipment is quite important. So we work with some of our customers to basically have sort of standard templates that they're loading in the parameters that they're looking to monitor and set alarm parameters when it comes to the DC portion, like if my battery gets too low, you know, all these types of scenarios. And we can develop a template where they can then just propagate that, uh, that setup to multiple ICT devices at once without having to you know, go through and, and go through that process over and over uh, for each individual device. So we're working on tools uh, to enable deployment of multiple ICT devices in a, in a fairly quick and effective manner. Very cool. Neat. Um, let me ask this question. So, um, you know, we've talked quite a bit about backhaul and we've talked about uh, multi-gigabit speeds. Let's, let's go one level a little bit lower on the CPE side of the house here, Jamie. Um, you know, are you guys, uh, or uh, from a roadmap perspective, how are the CPEs going to keep up with uh, these high speeds? And are you guys developing products today uh, that can do that? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, we, we recently made a, our first kind of sets of announcements on the gigabit stuff. We've, we've already got, uh, you know, a CPE doing 3.72 gigabits. Um, if you need to go that high, most, most people won't. Um, it's pretty, pretty smoking and you, you know, your, the ability to do this stuff at, at three, you know, three miles, you know, et cetera, is pretty incredible. Um, and that, that's, that, that's the, the, the hard part's not the physics. It, it's really being able to take advantage of, of obviously, um, off the shelf commercial grade chip technology, but making it hardened and making it work in a carrier style environment, which is really what Airspan is kind of helped the mimosa side really get control under, you know, we're using this technology now for cellular backhaul, even in multi-point uh, base, sta you know, base stations now. And, uh, you know, we've now deployed hundreds of thousands of links of backhaul using this technology. So we're like super confident that we can keep up the performance that's necessary um, and get the cost to the point to be able to deploy those kinds of numbers. Uh, so the hardest thing here is just keeping the cost reasonable. Um, even though, you know, in CAF and, and with RDOF, I think the funds will be there. But a lot of that, that fund goes into steel. It goes into construction and concrete and yep. planning. And, you know, just the vast number of people that are out there. And these, these, these are companies putting in seven, eight hundred towers, in, you know, in, in, each, in a tranche of deployment. Um, yep. So, you know, for us as much as I'd love to be able to go out and have $500 CPEs that are like amazing, we really have to focus on keeping the cost down. So I think our pride point in this will be to keep the costs to be genera generational, but it's, you know, I think we always look at it as a dollars per gigabit per second. And you're going to find that even com compared to what we were doing with 802.11ac uh, previously technology, you know, we're actually going to go way, way further down in, in cost per gigabit because of all of this. Now, I think we need to keep the prices in that in that range of reasonable, uh, of course, you know, what you actually end up buying for a CPE. So our biggest goal has been how do we keep really aggressive cost and keep that performance up and get the advantages of the next gen technology, which is more noise isolation, bigger channels, OFDMA latency being really low. I mean, I want to get down to sub five millisecond latencies in multipoint networks, and nobody's done that before. Uh, so that's that's really the goal, and I think where we've achieved. Um, so now it's just really a finishing this process, letting the FCC get done with the six gigahertz rules and process there, and also us finishing off getting five G radios that can also handle large channels for things like CBRS and taking a bunch of GAA and PAL channels and being able to deliver you know high performance services there too so a lot of work being done i mean it's just an army of of of, of people who are focused on this uh on both sides of the shop for us uh, to to make that happen from a cost and performance perspective nice very cool so when i when i look back to calf and we're still seeing funds flow from calf and we will for years here um you know, the uh, the way that played out is the funding flows over the course of 10 years, but the FCC really wants those WISPs to uh, deliver within three to five years. And even in talking to the operators, they're saying, hey, um, we've got to deliver this network fast. Uh, it, a little bit of CAF and RDOF funding, it's a, both a blessing and a curse. You're going to have uh, uh, the money will flow every single month. Auditors will be there. Are you... Uh, delivering uh, and deploying your networks on pace? Are you staying on pace? And the question over to you, uh, Blair, is can you give us an example where you had a really complex uh, situation with a customer or an operator, and how did you help them scale quickly? Because that's the name of the game here with these these federal funds. So can you give us an example of that? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, we work very closely with the, with the customer in terms of understanding what they're what their deployment needs are going to be in terms of volumes. Um, you, you know, we are a manufacturer, and fortunately for us, we do actually manufacture here in North America. Um, and the facility I'm sitting in right now is, is where we build all our equipment. So having the ability to, uh, you know, have the manufacturing you know, in-house is, is very advantageous for us in terms of scaling up quite quickly and, 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 and being able to respond quite quickly. So... We work with a lot of our, you know, channel partners and, and the end user customer to understand what those in needs are moving forward. Um, and we're able to, you know, scale up and, and stock inventory at various different, you know, segments in the supply chain to support, you know, the quickly ramping uh, deployment that is occurring. So we, we tend to try and keep, a, you know, a buffer inventory based on the forecast demand. 
Um, so it, that can be drawn from, you know, if, if things ramp up very quickly, um, we're able to sort of have that buffer inventory where we sort of take the burden away from the manufacturing, so to speak, and we have that buffer inventory in the channel. So it's just all about communicating very closely with the customer, understanding what their deployment needs are, um, and understanding the power requirements at each of the individual sites and, and, and just being ahead of the curve when it comes to forecasting. And, and so far, you know, obviously we've been working with a lot of cast customers over the last few years and, and they have been ramping up quite significantly and, and we've been able to keep up with demand without any, any, any concerns on that part. So um, it's, it's just all about, you know, having that uh, visibility and, and making sure that we're, uh, we're keeping buffer inventory in the channel to support these guys. And I hear you partner with some pretty rock star logistical companies that uh, do distribution as well. <laughs> well, that's so exactly it. I mean, keeping that, that inventory in the channel, um, you know, sitting on the shelf so we can support uh, the, our mutual customers um, and working very closely with Wave and, and, uh, and making sure that those products are on the shelf to support, support the customer's needs as they, they're deploying these types of networks. All right, as, as the moderator of the podcast panel, I do have to throw in the shameless plugs there every once in a while, guys. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. All right, guys, I, I got one last question for you both here. Um, you know, we, we are in these times with COVID, and, and clearly uh, CAF was pre-COVID, uh, but the federal government is very focused on connecting uh, America, for sure. Uh, and you see that in CAF funding being available uh, RDOF funding. We now have um, CARES Act funding, which is, is going on right now to address what's going on with COVID and making sure um, we are connecting students and, and critical infrastructure, um, our hospitals. Uh, it, it's clear there's a lot of unserved and underserved areas. As you guys look out for years to come, do you anticipate a lot more federal funding um, being made available? Uh, it's kind of a softball lob question, guys, but what, what, do you, what do you see and what's your opinion? Are you sure you want to ask a question that probably has a political answer? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I think. I mean, there's no doubt. I, I, I mean, obviously, you, you, we can hear the on both sides of, of the aisle what they they are, they all seem to be saying we need more broadband. So I think it's just going to be a question of how that gets done. I think that you know there will be a lot more emphasis on truing up broadband maps um, if. You know, if, if it goes as it's supposed to go um, currently with uh, Biden coming into office and probably a big change at the FCC, uh, I think there will be a lot more focus of, of, you know, as we saw a little bit of early in this administration of, you know, trying to get better data on mapping and speeds. But um, that's I think there's going to be a lot more effort in that area and more focus of very specific types of funds. Uh, as opposed to a bit, bit more generic and, uh, you know, the mapping exercises. So I would absolutely say there's no doubt in my mind that there's going to be more of these because of COVID. And to your point, everything we've seen so far, it's a huge amount of money before COVID. So yeah. now it's like, how can, they, how can they more rapidly adjust to that and hopefully avoid another situation like this medically, but be ready for it in a much better fashion in the future where every house is connected and you know whether you know, that's the big question is it's not just underserved and and uns and, and unconnected areas now it's going to also have to be social you know so social good and making sure that even if you couldn't do it kids have got to get connected for schools and uh, if you couldn't afford that um you, you know you can't afford a you know some of these people charging 79 99 dollars a month that's not going to get the job done in underserved urban areas um, i think there's going to be a, a focus on that too not just rural. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Blair, how about you, sir? What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's pretty much a bipartisan thing that the, the, the broadband is needed, for, and particularly, you know, this COVID has a, it highlighted that very, uh, very much in terms of working from home and educating from home, etc. I mean, it's not just in the United States. We're a Canadian company. We're seeing the same thing up in, happening up here in Canada as well in terms of the universal broadband fund to, to get, uh, you know, broadband access to underserved communities. Um, so it's, it's happening across the board. It will continue to happen. This has just kind of forced the issue a little bit more and, and brought it to the forefront with the COVID situation. And it's not just, you know, obviously working from home and all the benefits that that, that provides and having high-speed internet. It, it's, it's a global marketplace. Um, com countries need to be competitive uh, as we look at, you know, broadband speeds in other countries and, and what they're able to do. So 
it's also you know making sure that we're keeping up in terms of having you know, uh, the right amount of broadband speeds in a global environment and being competitive in a global marketplace. So, um, yeah, no, I, you see it at the federal level, you even see it at the state level, there's all kinds of funding that's been released. Um, so I don't anticipate that changing any time in the near future, that's for sure. Blair, I think you meant the province level, not the state level. <laughs> yes, you're right. In, but even <laughs> within the United States too, there's actually some state level stuff too, but you're right, the province level. <laughs> right, right. All right, gentlemen. Well, this has been a, a great session. I want to thank you both for your time. Um, you know, thank you guys also for manufacturing great products that are just innovative and, and keeping these operators out in the forefront of these funds and being able to connect America. So you're you're doing your part here, um, and uh, really, really appreciate it. Uh, always great to see you guys, and uh, look forward to another session in the future here. Thank you, Jamie Fink from Airspan Mimosa. Thank you, Blair Clements from ICT. We'll see you guys next time. Thank Thanks, you. gentlemen. Thank you. Bye-bye.